Good morning, good afternoon. Hello, everybody. Uh, you're all very welcome to this morning's or this afternoon's, wherever you may be around the world, uh, to this webinar this morning uh, on the uh, development of bio-based fertilizers for a circular bioeconomy. So this is a webinar hosted by and involving members of the Manure Management Network of the GRA, part of the Livestock Research Group. So the Manure Management uh, Network is co-led by Hod Min Dong and, and Tony van der Reerden. And really what we're trying to do here today is to gather up more membership and more involvement and more research activities and look at the commonalities between some of the research happening around uh, different countries. I guess in relation to the manure management network, um, this really is a forum uh, where there's an overall focus on reducing greenhouse gas emissions from livestock uh, through the improvement of manure management. And we're going to touch on a lot of that, those concepts uh, through the presentations uh, this morning. So just first of all, to introduce myself, my name is Sinead Waters. I'm based at Chagask in Ireland, uh, and I'm co-chair of the Livestock Research Group of the GRA. And today, as part of the webinar, I'm joined by one of the leads, uh, Hong Min Dong, uh, Professor Hong Min Dong from China, um, and she is from the Chinese Academy for Agricultural Sciences. Uh, she co-leads the Manure Management Network um, and is, uh, is here with us today. I may get involved during the discussions of the and during the presentations. Um, so the webinar today will last uh, for two hours. It's being recorded and, and the video will be made available for future viewings uh, via the GRA website. So for those who missed it, you can tell your colleagues who've missed it that you can actually pick it up uh, on the website at a later time and a time that's convenient. Also today, we'll be hearing from three presentations from different countries, um, and there'll be brief clarifying Q&A session uh, after each presentation. So if something's not clear to you, you may put it in the chat. Uh, and then we will move on afterwards, after all three presentations, to a panel discussion. So we'd really welcome uh, all your questions uh, during that time, we can take up your questions there. So please submit your questions as we're going through the session. Uh, via the Q&A function and we get through as many as we can uh, today. If you see a question that you like or you agree with, uh, please use it, use the upvote so button so that we know this is a popular one and we can take this ahead of some others. Uh, and if you, so if your question is not answered, uh, it has not been dismissed in any way, we will take it up later. We will send the questions to all the uh, presenters and we will put those up on the website at a later date. So to start the proceedings today, um, I'm delighted to welcome our first speaker, who is a colleague of my own in Chagask. Uh, he's Dr. Patrick Forrestal, a senior research officer working in the Crops, Environment and Land Use Programme in Johnstown Castle in, in Wexford in Ireland. He works mainly in the area of soils and plant nutrition, and his work provides solutions to the agri-food industry and policymakers, particularly in the synthetic, organic and bio-based recycled fertilizer space. Uh, Patrick's talk today is entitled Opportunities and Challenges of Meeting Crop and Soil Nutrient Requirements Using Bio-Based Fertilizers. So over to you, Patrick. Looking forward to your presentation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sinead. And... Thank you very much, Sinead, and it's it's nice to join with you all this morning to, to talk a little bit on this on this topic. I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen now. Um, it should be coming up. Sorry, Patrick. Yeah, I just full screen. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Very, very good. So look at, I suppose, in the in the time frame of a short 20 minute presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit on this issue of opportunities and challenges for um, bio-based fertilizers um, based on some of our own experiences doing trial work with them in the frame of uh, two EU projects, uh, Renew to Farm and Nutri to Cycle. And look, I'm not going to attempt to be um, totally comprehensive in, in the opportunities and challenges, but rather to talk a little bit from our own experiences. Um, and some of those may, I suppose, um, be useful to you in your own countries or um, maybe commonality with some of the things you're finding yourself. I want to acknowledge uh, our, our own team here at uh, Johnstone Castle, um, uh, particularly Ashik, who's been working on, on this particular work, along with collaborators at University of Ghent, UL, and Munster Technological University in Ireland, and Carlo IT, who we've worked together um, on different aspects of, of this site, um, and also the broader consortiums um, in those projects. <laughs> So look at, I suppose, a little bit of background to myself and the team and, and, and what we do. Um, as Siobhan 
or sorry, as Sinead um, mentioned, we, we work in this area of uh, fertilizers generally and the bioeconomy um, and the circular economy has come more, I suppose, into the fore. We have ongoing work with conventional mineral fertilizers, but this these bio-based fertilizers, I suppose, are something that we see developing as time goes on. Um, and look at in the work that we do, we try and integrate agronomy losses to to water and to air, along with uh, soil soil health. So look at, I suppose, in the whole area of bio-based fertilizers, look, we need nutrients for crops where we're, we're taking off nutrients. Um, just a few, I suppose, pictures to illustrate this um, from some of my own experiences with various trial work uh, in North America and, and here in, in Ireland. Um, look, here's a, a maize crop with and without nitrogen. Um, I suppose getting off of mineral fertilizers by using more uh, legumes is, is an option for us there. Uh, for phosphorus, this is a wheat trial with and without phosphorus. Uh, so if you run down uh, phosphorus levels, uh, this can be an issue over time. And I suppose in Europe, there's more of a consciousness around this um, that's feeding into that circular bioeconomy, given our reliance on importing phosphorus. And um, this is a potassium trial. Again, you see the effects of, of, of not having a particular nutrient in place. Everything else is there. and. Uh, some work that we have going on that's been recently published with sulfur, showing that where sulfur is needed, uh, it can improve nitrogen use efficiency and indeed reduce nitrate leaching, which I suppose covers, I suppose, benefits to the farmer and to the, to the environment. So look at, I suppose, my journey on this uh, bio-based fertilizer side of things uh, was, was, I suppose, spurred on by being part of a EIP Agri focus group, that's an EU uh, focus group that looked at this area um, back in 2016. And during that, uh, met uh, others that were working on in this area around Europe, including Lars, who's going to speak uh, later. And we looked at this issue of how to improve recycling um, of um, nutrients and organic sources and some of the challenges associated with that. Um, and there's a number of mini papers that have been published um, on these uh, various topics that are there um, on the uh, EU um, website, if some of you are interested in looking at them later. But I suppose generally this idea of circularity and returning uh, nutrients uh, back to the crop, um, including the use of bio refineries as a feature of um, these bio-based fertilizers and, uh, and because some of them can be quite bulky and, and getting them back to where they're needed. So look at, I'm going to focus a good bit on uh, phosphorus in the trial work that we've we've done um, has been quite focused on the phosphorus um, aspect of, of bio-based fertilizers. But of course there are um, other nutrients that can be returned through bio-based fertilizers. But I suppose back some years ago, I, I visited a, a phosphate mine in Florida and I suppose this, this gave me a real insight into just the magnitude of work that goes on for that mineral phosphorus fertilizer that a farmer buys in a bag and has access to, you know, just a level of earth um, and th that had to be moved, uh, pumped to a station to actually separate out and refine down the, the uh, phosphorus fertilizer. And I suppose this really brought home to me how fortunate we are in the first instance to be able to access it, but also in the second instance, that reliance that we have on importing phosphorus in Europe and the need to recycle it and reuse it where possible. Um, it doesn't make sense to be losing it in waste streams when you have such an intensive process um, there to actually dig it out of the ground and produce it. So working with um, colleagues um, around Ireland, we recently published a paper looking at the um, deficit and requirements of the National Phosphorus Balance in Ireland. And that paper has been recently published, but I suppose just to highlight that in Ireland, as an example, we import um, about 43,000 tonnes of uh, P, that's nutrient P, um, into the country every year. So definitely there's a requirement for phosphorus um, and a potential to um, recover it from waste streams to at least in part offset uh, that requirement for imported mineral fertilizer. 
So look, a big factor in why this hasn't moved to date um, or that I feel that can stimulate um, the use of these fertilizers over time is these national and EU strategies. Um, at a national policy level, the bioeconomy in Ireland is, is becoming more to the fore. And there's a policy there, I suppose, direction that's using residues that have previously been waste and putting them to use, including in farming. And of course, at a European Union level, the farm to fork strategy, strategy highlights um, the reduction in, in the use of conventional fertilizers by 20% by 2030, but also highlights this use of bio, advanced biorefineries to produce biofertilizers, um, which will, I suppose, allow for a reduction with, without, uh, in, in, in imports without running down soil fertility, as we've seen in previous pictures in the presentation can be a, an issue. So look, I suppose this is a global presentation and in, in Ireland, as probably in many of your countries, we have certain quirks in how we uh, look at uh, nutrients and express it in its application rates. Um, one of those, let's say quirks, uh, ironically, isn't, um, isn't the use of, of P205, K2, K2, K2O and SO3. Um, we, we actually express everything on an elemental basis, which isn't the case in most countries. Um, but I will present the information on an, on an elemental basis, as I suppose it would be in a scientific paper. But uh, you can make the conversions with those um, conversions there if, if you wish. And um, we have a soil index system that runs from one, which is very low, to uh, four, which um, is higher sufficient for uh, phosphorus and potassium. And these have particular banding, banding levels. I introduced this because um, this is just an overview of about 30, almost 30,000 samples. Uh, in 2019 in, of Irish grassland. And you can see about a quarter of all samples fall into each of the index levels. Um, so look for these, these first index one through three, they need phosphorus to match crop offtake. And these lower two index levels need build up phosphorus to bring them towards the optimum for agronomic levels. Uh, so certainly we need phosphorus, I suppose, is highlighted there. So what role can bio-based fertilizers play? As part of these projects, um, we've looked at um, a number of, of sources of bio-based uh, fertilizers. They contain a variety of nutrients, but in, in particular, um, they're quite strong on the phosphorus side, uh, struvites, some ashes, and some dairy processing residues. And we include slurry um, also because it's a kind of a reference that farmers are, are familiar with. And these are some of the materials. You can see the pictures of them there. Um, and, and what they look like. And I think this is one of the, one of the challenges for bio-based fertilizers is having a product that a farmer can easily, easily spread. Um, but oh, so too is, is, a, is somewhat of an issue. Um, the, the concentration of, of the nutrients that's in those particular products on a fresh weight basis. If you compare it to the mineral pea, and here is one of the quirks of fertilizer um, in, in Ireland, so in most countries, I suppose it's triple superphosphate, 20, 21% uh, P um, on an elemental basis. In Ireland, it's also triple superphosphate, but it's delivered as a 16% product that's called super P. So this, you can take it as, as, as triple superphosphate, but it's in Ireland, it's a 16% product um, the farmers can access. And you can see that the others, the struvites and the ashes, um, have a better level of, of phosphorus availability, but they're still not as concentrated as the mineral pea and the dairy processing that residues are lower. And of course, something like cattle slurry is not very concentrated um, at all. And hence the issue often with moving that phosphorus out of areas of intensive livestock production to cropland areas and that issue around biorefineries perhaps to help that. So as part of and um, this interreg project, uh, Renew to Farm and the Nutri to Cycle project, which is ongoing, we've had uh, trials with these in grassland and also um, in an arable setting. And really, there was two uh, elements in the grassland. One was just to derive how available was the phosphorus that was there, and the other side was to integrate it into a um, program of continual application as such a farmer would use. And that trial work is in its fourth year now. Um, we also have it on, on an arable site, but for the purposes of today, I'll just focus on the availability of the P side of things. Um, 
we had a grassland um, site which was low fertility, and um, so it was in that index one level. Um, it had a, a five replications, and the cutting program would have been three silage harvests with one residual cut. And at the beginning of the trial in 2019, we put on 40 kilograms of pea per hectare, which would be recommended rate um, for a single year. And we applied N, K, and S to subsequent harvests in accordance with, with recommendations, really to, to pull that phosphorus out. And we went on with continual cuts with no extra um, P being applied, just what was applied at the start. We've published some of that work. Um, this is looking at just the dairy processing uh, waste or sludge um, based on the first year um, availability relative to mineral P. And you can see here, I suppose, the thing to highlight here is that two dairy sludges behaving quite differently in terms of phosphorus availability. And I think this is one of the challenges for bio-based fertilizers. You can't just, I suppose, group them into dairy sludges and say they're all going to perform the same or, or the same as mineral fertilizer. Indeed, we see that one, uh, an aluminium precipitated sludge performs equally to superphosphate, whereas the calcium uh, precipitated dairy sludge isn't as available in, in the first year, at least. Um, We've, we, we've also looked at nitrogen fertilizer availability, and uh, this has been uh, published uh, as well. Um, and again, here you see they do contain some nitrogen. They're really more of a phosphorus source. But again, there are differences between the sludges in terms of how available um, the nitrogen is in comparison to calcium ammonium nitrate. Um, so this has important man management implications for farmers trying to you know, determine rates for, for various crops. Um, in collaboration with, with some of the partners that I, I mentioned, um, so this in this case with Carlo IT, we've published some work looking at um, what's, what about the bacterial diversity um, associated with applying some of these different bio-based fertilizers. And this work has again been published and you know there's detailed information in the paper, but um, just a, as some headline aspects, um, Anna found that the bacterial diversity was maintained or enriched by using struvite um, and the ash uh, recycle derived fertilizers as they refer to here. Um, however, they found that the sewage sludge ash unfavorably affected nematode diversity. Um, however, neither struvite impacted the nematode communities. So some information coming there just in terms of um, impacts on the soil, soil communities. Now I'm going to share with you now some unpublished data. Uh, we did those single year trials uh, to look at the P availability in a single year. I mentioned that we applied once at the beginning, but I was interested to see what if we kept going. And I think oftentimes with this work, you know, there's a pressure to publish initially um, and maybe the trials don't run over the longer term. So this work has now been going on for, for three full seasons uh, on top, after that initial um, 40 kilogram application. So what I'm going to share now is expressed here as apparent P recovery of applied P versus the zero P control. Um, so slightly different to the, the other uh, graphs, but I think highlights one of the challenges around phosphorus. So if we look just at the first harvest, how did these do? The super P alone versus the others. Um, we see that about 10% of the, the apparent P recovery was about 10% for the super P fertilizer in the first harvest. And um, the cattle story um, and super P combination, let's say, was similar. The struvites were also quite, so their availability was fast, if you like. So what you can see here for that first harvest, pretty fast availability for, for these four versus for the ashes and the dairy sludges. And if we look at the first year, um, add that on, increased to about 15% for the super P, the struvite um, is doing very well. It has higher apparent recovery um, compared to the super P. Um, the ash materials are lower and the dairy sludges, you can see that difference emerging there. And indeed there's some difference for the ash material as well, but the struvites are more consistent uh, even though they're from uh, quite different sources. So I suppose at this point, we published uh, some data from the dairy sludge and um, I was interested to let, let's keep going with this as we could do that within the frame of the project. Um, if we look at the second year availability, um, that increased again. 
Um, but we see there wasn't a whole lot coming from the super P, whereas we continue to see phosphorus coming from the struvite and from this cattle surrey. Um, and the sludges were particularly interesting. That lime treated dairy sludge, which we saw in the first year, as not having very good availability. When we consider the second year also, we see that it's now actually moved up to supplying um, as much phosphorus um, as the super P fertilizer. And the aluminium dairy sludge is, is gone ahead of it again. Again, we see differences in the ash. And um, so I suppose this is one of the aspects of bio-based fertilizers that I want to highlight really. Um, rather than getting too caught up in the specifics of this particular trial. Um, we also kept going for a third year. At the end of the second year, I was like, well, you know, let's can see if we can keep this going again and see what happens. Um, and I suppose what we can conclude from this really is that the, the stru there's opportunities there for the struvite to be at least as good and from this uh, better than the superphosphate in terms of its uh, apparent recovery. And for the ash material, which looked very poor over the course of one year, um, it is giving some phosphorus over the longer term, but there are differences between the ashes and the same story for the, the lime, uh, for, the, for the dairy sludges. So, so I suppose just in some conclusions, uh, some opportunities to highlight that, that I, I've noticed, and I'm sure many of you have as well. Look, there's a clear need for nutrients. Um, and we can address this by using bio-based fertilizers, and they indeed may be able to help us with some of the challenges with conventional fertilizers, such as the mineral pea, which is you know, fast available, but getting locked up quickly. Um, there is a policy driver at play there now, um, and a potential for uh, soil health um, aspects. Um, obviously, we have that um, role in cost, which is you know very much for this year and the security of supply if we can recycle nutrients that we have close at hand. And, and look, it is the right thing to do. Um, some challenges there, look, the cost and transport of bulky materials is, is without doubt an issue. Um, field validation is needed. You can't assume that they're same, going to be the same performance, even in the same class of material, which, um, which I think some of this work highlights. Um, some environmental performance testing is probably warranted as, as well. Um, I think this granulation issue is a big one that needs attention. If farmers are going to spread the material, they need to be able to put it in their spreader and, 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 and apply it um, in a way that competes with mineral fertilizer. So um, I think that's an area uh, for attention. Also the concentration of the nutrients and then this issue around advisors being able to um, match up the crop requirements and the soil requirements with mineral and bio-based fertilizers probably working together to hit that requirement. And of course, the whole area of regulation and certification is a big one too. And um, so with that, I'll, I'll wrap it up and, uh, and, uh, and Thank I look you, forward to uh, the subsequent presentations and discussions later. Thank you, Patrick, uh, for a very clear presentation, very interesting presentation, and uh, particularly your new data there that you've shared. Um, there's just a few quick questions um, here from Gina. With the impact of different recycled P inputs on microbial communities, were these compared to super P mineral fertilizer? Um, yeah, yes, that, that was one of the, the treatments yeah. that uh, evaluated there, and the full details are in that, that paper. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, another one here. What do you mean by activated dairy sludge? Um, so um, th this, this activated dairy sludge is, I suppose, just a, a local term for it, but essentially it's aluminium precipitated uh, dairy sludge. Yeah. Perfect. And um, finally down here, can we say that uh, composted manure application has an inhibitory um, effect on the nematodes? So, so composted manure wasn't one of the treatments that we used, so no, no that wouldn't be the case. Um, yeah. But uh, again, the full details are in that paper. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Um, we might move on in the interest of time. And thank you, Patrick. We'll come back to more questions in the panel discussion. But thank you for that. That was a great start off to the, the webinar today. So our second speaker uh, today is, uh, gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Lea Linas uh, Angele. Deputy Director of uh, BETA, Beta Technological Center um, in Spain. She is a chemical engineer by training. She's a PhD in chemical engineering, and she's currently 
uh, working in the, as I said, the Better Technological Centre as Deputy Director. She has expertise in the preparation and execution of national and international research projects um, in Spain and internationally, and has knowledge and knowledge transfer uh, and public sector experience. So her research is focused on water treatment, uh, wastewater reuse, and membrane technologies. Uh, and Leia's presentation today is on from, from farm to market, upcycling manure to improved fertilizing products. So thank you, uh, Leia. We might start sharing your screen. Can you see my presentation? I can, Leia. Thank you. That looks great. OK, Over so uh, good morning. Good morning to everyone. Um, and first of all, I would like to thank the organizers from the Manure Management Network for this invitation and also thanks to CNAT for uh, her nice introduction. It's a pleasure for me to be here today. And um, my presentation is titled From Farm to Market, Upcycling Manure to Improve Fertilizing Products. And uh, with this presentation, I would like to explain you the work that we are uh, developing in the, in the European project uh, Ferti Manure. So as you have already heard in, in my introduction, I'm now working in Beta Technological Center, uh, which is based in uh, Catalonia, in Spain. And specifically, we are based in a region named Uzona, where the agri-food sector is the main activity, generating 20% uh, of jobs, uh, which suppose the 26% of companies uh, of this region and provides more than 50% of the turnover of, of, uh, of this um, territory. Uzona counts with uh, more than 2,000 uh, farms and 2.2 million of livestock heads, which are producing more than eight and a half million kilons of nitrogen each year. And moreover, the half of this nitrogen produced is excess nitrogen, which is causing, uh, of course, a serious nitrogen surplus in, in our region. So this environmental problem that we have in, in, in Ozona, uh, and it's, uh, which is caused by the livestock uh, sector, is uh, also reality in many uh, other European countries. And this was the main reason why we decided uh, to start working in, in a project like uh, Ferti Manure that I will be explaining uh, here today. So as a brief introduction, uh, so as you know, nowadays the uh, EU livestock sector is the largest in the world. Meat, milk and eggs make up 40% uh, of the EU's agricultural value and it accounts for 48% uh, of the total EU agricultural activity with an estimated annual output value of uh, more than 100 billion euros, uh, creating employment of, uh, for almost 30 million people. And it is estimated that the total farm livestock population in Europe excrete around uh, 1,400 million of tons of manure annually. Total nitrogen and uh, phosphorus extracted by livestock in EU are estimated to be between 7 and 9 uh, million tons of nitrogen per year and 1.8 million of tons of phosphorus per year. Currently, manure is applied to land, incinerated, exported, or in less cases, used to produce valuable valuable products such as bio-based fertilizers, and the main disposal route is land application. So in fact, more than 90% of um, the manure produced in Europe is currently returned to agricultural fields, either through the, the spreading of collected manure or directly by, by grazing. In that sense, uh, so it's clear that animal manure has um, a real environmental impact. So uh, here in these maps, we can see animal uh, density, which gives an indication of the pressure that livestock farming places on the environment. And as shown in these figures, uh, there is the strongest concentration of livestock in regions such as uh, South and uh, Central Netherlands, the bordering regions uh, in Germany, and also in North uh, Belgium, whereas the, low, the lowest total livestock densities uh, among the member states are observed in Bulgaria, or in Slovakia and the Baltic countries. Uh, here in these figures, we can also see the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that are caused uh, by, by the manure excreted by livestock in, in Europe. So uh, in Ferti Manure, we have uh, made an initial evaluation of uh, the existing nitrogen imbalances in uh, six uh, relevant EU regions regarding manure production. This is these six countries were Spain, Italy, France, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Germany. And the aim of doing this natural imbalance analysis uh, was because we wanted to predict where the recovered nutrients from animal manure could contribute in the long-term sustainability of agriculture. 
So generally, the data that uh, we analyzed um, showed that animal manure sources can sustain nitrogen and phosphorus requirements in most of the studied countries, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Italy, whereas France and Sp uh, Spain data showed high difference within regions. Northern regions in these uh, countries needed uh, mineral fertilizers input to sustain plant uptake uh, from soil, for example. And Germany is the only country that needs mineral fertilizers input in all regions. Uh, these results indicated that uh, it's necessary to transform part of the nitrogen and phosphorus from animal sources into bio-based fertilizers that can be distributed throughout different regions and countries, and thus uh, reducing importation and usage of mineral sources. So um, after this, uh, this brief introduction, um, our question was how can we solve the, the problem that manure is uh, currently generating in uh, many EU regions and how we can help in improving the nutrient balances across Europe. So our aim is uh, to consider ways uh, reaching nutrients as, a, as an opportunity and more specifically as a business opportunity. So here in, in um, in this slide, so I'm repeating a little bit uh, some of the challenges that Patrick already mentioned. So I'm listing uh, here some of the main challenges related in this case with manure management. Um, so we have the problem of an increasing global demand of mineral fertilizers together with the resource depletion to produce these fertilizing products. So I liked a lot the, how Patrick explained the problem that we, we currently have uh, with phosphorus and the need to find alternat uh, alternative sources. But um, apart from having these uh, needs, so we are producing millions of tons of manure every year, which is not properly managed and contains a big amount of nutrients. And uh, something uh, also important is that we also have uh, some barriers related to political and social uh, issues. So we have to see how all these challenges can be considered uh, as opportunities and um, uh, so uh, here I'm listing uh, uh, possible opportunities uh, that we can, that a good management of the nutrients uh, of uh, manure can provide to different actors of the value chain. So, for example, in the livestock sector, manure valorization can diversify uh, the revenue, source, revenue resources. They can create new farm activities, bringing new business opportunities in the current fertilizers market. For the agricultural sector, they will have available uh, new fertilizing products with the same quality than the current ones. The chemical industry can also be benefited by diversifying the nutrient sources for fertilizers production. Technology providers will also have new market opportunities for selling technologies for new purposes. Then the policymakers uh, will uh, have available new policy relevant information to support and promote new policies and legislation enhancing circular bioeconomy. And then for the society, having alternative nutrient sources will ensure food security and, and sustainable agriculture. Um, here I'm showing the, the Fertimanure circular uh, economy strategy that we plan uh, for a more sustainable manure management. The first step in this approach would be to implement nutrient recovery technologies to obtain bio-based fertilizers from animal manure. Once the nutrients have been recovered, we are considering three possible uh, management strategies to be followed. First one is that the bio-based fertilizers obtained and recovered on farm can be directly used in the same farm or in the surrounding fields. Second one is that the bio-based fertilizers can be sold to the chemical industry in order to use them to produce tailor-made fertilizers with a high market value. We understand a tailor-made fertilizer as a fertilizer specifically formulated to meet uh, specific crop requirements. I will better define uh, later in my presentation what are we exactly considering as a TMF. And the final strategy that we are proposing is to directly produce the tailor-made fertilizers on farm by mixing animal manure with different supplements or additives. The first approach that I mentioned targets mixed farming systems where nutrients can be directly used, whereas the second and the third strategies uh, would be better suited for a specialized livestock farming in which the nutrient excess must be exported from, from the region. Both appro uh, approaches complement each other and would contribute to solve the inter and intra-regional nutrient imbalances that I mentioned at the beginning. 
So building from the shown circular economy strategy, the main goal that we have in Fertimanure is to develop, integrate, test, and validate innovative nutrient management strategies to efficiently recover mineral nutrients and other relevant products with agronomic value from animal manure. So we are obtaining organic amendments, biostimulants, and mineral fertilizers with the idea to obtain safe um, and reliable products that can compete in the European fertilizer uh, market. So since the beginning, we wanted that Fertimanure could go beyond than a simple project focused on, on nutrient recovery technologies. So we wanted to propose real solutions uh, to solve regional and interregional nutrient imbalances, uh, exporting nutrients in a high added value form. And to reach that, we are obtaining high quality, safe and marketable fertilizing products from animal manure. These fertilizing products, as I mentioned before, include not only mineral fertilizers, but also organic amendments and, and biostimulants. And uh, we are working in developing a specific and complementary business models and exploitation strategies covering all actors from the value chain. Finally, uh, we do not want to forget that our solutions should be in line and have an impact to all those uh, EU initiatives linked to nutrient management and fertilizing products use, including uh, policies and legislation. So Fertimanuri's technology is nutrient management, its quality and safety, its business, and also its acceptance. And in the following slides, um, I want to explain you uh, briefly the main uh, pillars of Fertimanure that uh, will allow us to reach uh, our objectives. So first important thing in our projects are our on-farm pilots. The project has a total of five pilots directly installed on farms, aiming to valorize and recover nutrients from different types of manure. So we are targeting uh, pig slurry, cow manure, cow manure and poultry. And the pilots, as uh, you can see in this map, are located in different regions with relevant livestock sector. It's uh, Spain, Belgium, the Netherlands, France, and Germany. Here in the right side of my slide, I'm showing the infographic representing the technological scheme that we have implemented in the Spanish case. So in blue, you can see the technological units uh, that we have in this pilot. And in green, the bio-based fertilizing products that we are obtaining in, uh, in uh, Spain. So if you check in our website, you will find all the infographics uh, of our pilots. And um, the, the pilots that we have include different but complementary technological schemes. Overall, with uh, the different technological approaches that uh, we have in our projects, uh, we are obtaining a total of 19 different bio-based fertilizing uh, products. But what do I mean exactly with a bio-based fertilizer and also a tailor-made fertilizer that, I'm, uh, that I mentioned uh, before? So in Fertimanure, we are considering the bio-based fertilizer as a fertilizing products or a resource for the production of tailor-made fertilizers that is derived from biomice-related resources. The bio-based fertilizers in Fertimanure are obtained through a physical, thermal, thermochemical, chemical and or biological processes for the treatment of manure or digestate that results into a change in composition due to a change in concentration of nutrients and the ratios compared to the input material in order to get better marketable products. So we are recovering the nutrients uh, from manure and we are obtaining uh, these 19 different products that I mentioned. So these uh, bio-based fertilizers can directly be used as a product or can be considered as a raw material to obtain tailor-made fertilizers. Tailor-made fertilizer is a customized fertilizer that meets with the nutrient requirements of a specific crop, but taking into account the soil type, the soil type, soil fertility status, and growing conditions and fertilization practices. And we are producing them using the bio-based fertilizers and or other mineral fertilizers as supplements to improve the formulation. So in Fertimanure, we will be working in the formulation of different tailor-made fertilizers, considering different crops and different soil types, demonstrating that the nutrients coming from, anim from animal manure can end as a high added value fertilizing products. So to specifically formulate uh, tailor-made fertilizers, Fertimanure Consortium has designed what we call the TMF nutrition tool. This is an Excel tool aiming uh, to be easy to use uh, by farmers to efficiently calculate the optimal amounts of bio-based fertilizers and other mineral fertilizers to properly formulate a specific product 
uh, that can respond to specific uh, soil and crop uh, needs. This tool incorporates a large amount of uh, key variables and criteria for different soil and crop combinations, which are provided with the participation of the, of the project partners. And, um, and the idea is to, to include the, these uh, variables and then uh, you will have the formulation of your uh, tailor-made fertilizing. So once we have the bio-based fertilizers and the, bio the tailor-made fertilizers produced uh, in the project, we are assessing the agronomic performance of our products to see their uh, availability and suitability to, su to substitute current mineral fertilizers that are produced uh, based on finite uh, fossil-based resources. In that sense, uh, we will assess nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon carbon dynamics of manure uh, derived bio-based fertilizers, and we'll compare them to mineral fertilizers in controlled experimental conditions. Then we will evaluate and demonstrate agricultural and environmental performance of our products also compared to mineral ones in field trials, so in a more relevant uh, environment. And we will also have demonstration activities to demonstrate and communicate the obtained results to agricultural and users by a demonstration fields and sites uh, and interactive events. So we are already doing uh, our um, uh, agronomic assessment trials and until now we are obtaining quite satisfactory uh, results. Another uh, important pillar of our project is uh, to determine the sustainability, uh, techno-economic, environmental and socioeconomic performance of the technology developed and of the technologies developed, but also of the fertilizing products that we are producing. So for doing uh, the sustainability assessment, we will be following a cradle to grave uh, perspective, and thus we will determine the environmental, techno-economical and socio-economic socio impacts related to all the stages of the supply chain to know uh, how we are, well, the impacts that we are having in the whole uh, process. So based on the knowledge and outcomes uh, that we will be obtaining using this triple bottom-up um, sustainability assessment approach, we will be aiming to develop a decision support systems for, farmer and, uh, for farmers and end users, being the goal of this decision support system to determine which are the best end products to be produced, how, when, and where to produce them under any given scenario, consider uh, the different approaches, so technical, economic, environmental, social, but also regulatory aspects. And then the last uh, pillar that we are considering is all related to business and exploitation. So we are uh, working with, um, with different stakeholder groups that are uh, relevant for bio-based fertilizers development and their market uptake. So we are working on, uh, on developing a market analysis for bio-based fertilizing products in the different uh, participating countries uh, in our project. We are also working in developing a specific business plans for the different end products that we'll be producing. So the mineral fertilizers, the organic amendments and the biostimulants. Uh, and the final aim will be also to, to develop this long-term exploitation strategy that can support the, the successful integration of the bio-based fertilizers in the European fertilizers market. So we are doing all this uh, following a participatory approach. So it's not only the project partners working in all this uh, business development and exploitation strategy. It, we are in contact uh, with a different stakeholder. We are doing questionnaires and also performing different brain, brainstorm sessions with, with all of them. So to finish my uh, presentation, I would like just to briefly summarize the main outputs that we have obtained until now. So you will be able to find all, all the results in our website, but we have been uh, developing different region cards uh, with an overview of animal production, nutrient production and manure, manure management in the different uh, regions of our consortium. As I explained, we have been developing this nutrient imbalance analysis um, uh, of the different uh, regions uh, uh, to see where the nutrient recovery could uh, be used. Then we have also created a project database with information of different projects related with Perti Manure because we are aiming uh, to collaborate and to work with other projects to see how we can join forces and have a, a wider impact and also, of course, learn from each other. Um, we have also been doing a questionnaire on end user preferences to know uh, their opinion about bio-based fertilizing products. 
then uh, we have already uh, operating our five on farm experimental pilots for natin recovery. We are uh, producing the 19 uh, bio-based fertilizers that I, I already mentioned. We have uh, developed an innovative procedure to produce on-farm tailor-made fertilizers, directly mixing uh, manure with other uh, uh, supplements to directly produce these products. As I mentioned, we created this TMF nutrition tool to specifically formulate tailor-made fertilizers. In terms of sustainability assessment, we have uh, specifically developed tools for collecting life cycle inventory data. And we are also working in uh, preparing different practice abstracts to, uh, in order that our results can reach uh, farmers and other uh, stakeholders. So that's all from my side. So if you want to have more information about Fertimanure or also about Beta Technological Center, you can visit our website. And uh, thank you very much. And looking forward thank to you. questions and discussions. Thank you, Leah, for a very interesting presentation. And we've got lots of interest uh, coming in in the chat. Um, so before we move on, just to say to the attendees, if you can put your questions in the Q&A rather than the chat, that'd be really helpful for us here uh, just to pick up those questions. So one that has come in here, uh, Leah, just um, from Thomas, uh, and he's asking, um, you know, recovering uh, adds new costs uh, and how will, will will the recovered uh, Ferti manure compete with conventional cheaper fertilizers? Well, that, that's something that we, uh, of course, we will have to see the, the costs and, um, and the, well, uh, the investment and operational costs of the mm -hmm. technologies that we are proposing. <clears throat> but here it's not only about the cost, it's we also have to, to deal with the environmental issues. So if they yes. are not um, managing or recovering the nutrients of the, with, uh, of the manure, what are, we, what, what are they going to do with this manure? So of course, if, uh, if farmers cannot directly apply manure, there's no need to treat it. But if they cannot um, mm -hmm. do that, so they will have to look at, have a, a broader picture of, of the situation. So it's about manure management, it's about fertilizer production, and also the transport costs of this manure are not uh, cheap. So I would say, okay, maybe the production of the fertilizers is a little bit uh, cost or has a higher cost, but in mm -hmm. a broader uh, point of view, and also considering all the environmental issues and uh, policies uh, targeting yes, the course. bioeconomy. So I think in a wider picture, uh, we will win uh, with the strategies such as the ones proposed in, in Fertimanu. Yeah, and it might get cheaper over time, I suppose. And there are, as you say, broader issues of the environment and other issues uh, to take into play here as well. So there's another question, Leah, here um, from Veronica. Uh, can you be more specific about policy and social barriers you have encountered? Well, uh, in this case, it's about, um, of course, uh, sometimes uh, in terms of policies, uh, we have the, the new EU um, fertilizing product regulations. So we have... Uh, to be sure that our products are in line with this. And there are still some uh, specific points in this legislation that maybe will not consider some of our bio-based fertilizers as, e as a C marked fertilizing product. So we are mm -hmm. seeing how our products are in line with the new fertilizing product regulation, but also identifying which of our products do not fulfill the requirements and then our aim is to see how we can provide information to to broke some of the barriers and to see if we can um, make some force to to modify some aspects and in terms of social uh, so maybe uh, sometimes farmers uh, they prefer to use uh, fertilizers uh, mineral synthetic fertilizers in terms of safety use or whatever so we want to demonstrate that our products are also safe and can be used mm -hmm. uh, and can be as reliable as possible compared with the, the commercial ones. Yeah, and we might do more with the costs and the policy and social barriers in the, in the panel discussion. One very quick one here uh, from Alejandro, with the concept of nutrient as a business opportunity, um, are you trying to promote business specialized in management of manure? Um, is, it, is it thought as a business opportunity for BETA? Would you like that more farmers implement these practices? Uh, and do you see viability in the constitu constitu constitution constituents, I think, of these manure management companies um, and at which scale? So a lot of questions in there, Alejandro. Yes. Do you want to take <laughs> some of those? Um, well, uh, 
So uh, we want to, to provide different business models and one of them is for farmers. So we want to, to show farmers how uh, the implementation of these technologies will suppose a cost for them, but will also uh, be a benefit because they will be able to sell these nutrients. So at mm -hmm. the end, uh, this is business for different uh, stakeholder groups. It's business for farmers, but it's business for the fertilizing industry and it's business for technology uh, providers. Mm -hmm. Of course, great. We will get back to some more of those questions. So Leah, thanks so much for your presentation and answering those questions. Um, I'm going to introduce our third speaker. We'll have more, more conversation um, at the end of the, the three presentations, but thank you for now. And, and uh, I'm going to introduce our third speaker um, today. Uh, and our third, I'm delighted to welcome um, from Denmark, uh, Professor Lars um, Stuman uh, Jensen from the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. His research uh, focus has been on biological soil fertility and the influence of organic matter decomposition processes on nutrient turnover in agro ecosystems. His presentation today is entitled Developing New Bio-Based Fertilizers uh, from Organic Waste Upcycling for Optimal Use in Agriculture and Training a New Generation of Scientists for the Challenge. Insights from the Lex for Bio and the FertiCycle EU projects. So that's great. Uh, thanks, Lars. And uh, if you want to uh, share your screen. Thank you, Senef. And uh, right. good morning, good day, and good evening to all our, our listeners uh, or viewers uh, today. I'm really pleased uh, and honored to be invited to give a, a, a talk on this topic to, together with my two colleagues here. I can see that we really uh, supplement each other well, so that's uh, that's really good. So, uh, <clears throat> as Sinat said, I, my my the title of my tr presentation is developing new bio biobased fight for fertilizers from organic waste upcycling um, for use in agriculture, and then a perspective on the training of a new generation of scientists for that. Um, just a, a brief uh, bio. So it was already introduced by by Sinat, but. Generally, I have a, you can perhaps call me a generalist. I'm a professor of soil fertility and organic waste recycling, but I have worked with many different topics related to this. And I'm currently involved in a number of, of projects, both national here in Denmark and a number of EU projects. And the background for my presentation today is my involvement in two EU projects, supplementing the, the two other EU projects uh, presented by, by Patrick and, and Laia. So the, um, the Ferdy Cycle uh, Training Network that I'm the coordinator for and the Lex for Bio uh, project that I am a partner in. So <clears throat> we've already heard from, uh, from Patrick and Laia something about the nutrient imbalances that we have in, in Europe. And it's very, very clear that whether we look at a simple bar chart or a, a map of Europe, that there are significant uh, differences in nutrient balances here illustrate with the with the differences in uh, in phosphorus balance for agricultural soils and if we take a map i think that Laia also showed that the, the intensity of manure it's uh, very clear to see that the a lot of the imbalances in nutrient uh, uh, surplus is derived from uh, intensive uh, animal agriculture so basically a high density of, of livestock. And in order to protect the atmospheric and the aquatic environment, uh, there is a, a great political demand in the EU to implement uh, environmental regulations or environmental technologies. And that's of course also the background that there are actually numerous uh, EU funded projects on, on these issues. And it's also very clear that these imbalances in various regions, uh, countries of, of, uh, of Europe, basically uh, puts a, a, a requirement for redistribution of this surplus NNP as also exemplified by, by Laia in, in her presentation. And, and you can say the main reason for this need is of course that when you look at then some of the environmental uh, emissions and the environmental impacts, whether we are looking at uh, nitrogen leaching uh, to the aquatic environment, ammonia emissions to the atmospheric or greenhouse gas emissions, there is a very clear correspondence between the, the, the intensity and the form of agricultural activities and those environmental impacts. So why focus then on bio-based fertilizers? Well, I mean, there's a clear environmental demand, but there is of course at the same time also a, a requirement for 
for more uh, food and for more food security. And at the same time, this issue of NNP overlap is not just a European one, it's also a global one. And, uh, and uh, perhaps best exemplified with the, with the planetary boundaries concept. At the same time, as also mentioned by Patrick, um, some of our nutrient resources are relatively scarce. Maybe they don't run out tomorrow or in the ne next decade, but they are uh, uh, non-renewable and non-substitutable. -sub and that means that, okay, even at a, at a quite long time scale, they are scarce resources. So that again necessitates uh, some recovery and, and, and better recycling of, of these, uh, these nutrient sources. So that there are a couple of other drivers here because th this of course has forced uh, several uh, countries and several um, regions uh, globally to focus more on, on circular economy. And perhaps best exemplified is in the EU where the EU fertilizer regulation, the new EU fertilizer regulation, which will come into force this year, has a, a very, very clear focus on bio-based uh, fertilizers. And, and, uh, and I will come back to a little bit more detail on that. At the same time, there is also a development towards, uh, at least in affluent countries, for more uh, the consumer demand for organic products. And, and I mean, organic uh, agriculture uh, cannot live without uh, uh, nutrient input. So therefore, there is uh, also an increasing demand for more circular and, and certainly more safe and certified recycled organic fertilizers, uh, both in the EU, but also globally. So what is the basis then for, uh, for recycling in, uh, in, in Europe? Uh, as already exemplified by, by Laia, there is uh, quite a lot of manure. We are uh, one of the livestock intensive regions of the, of the world. So there is no doubt when we are looking at the at NNP recycling potential, by far the vast majority of that is actually manures. And, and, uh, and as I said, maybe 90% of this is actually recycled back into agricultural land. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that it's not optimally recycled because it's over-concentrated, resulting in these regional surpluses that you saw before. But we can also look at some of the other sources like bio-waste, uh, so from our household waste or, or from, from industry, um, slaughterhouse waste or, or sewage. They are not nearly as large in terms of neither nitrogen or phosphorus inputs, but they are still sub substantial uh, and are currently not utilized uh, uh, sufficiently. And it's interesting when we compare here in the EU, what are the, the nutrients or the nitrogen and the phosphorus in these um, potential resources compared to what is the average mineral fertilizer input and actually the, the, uh, the nutrient rich side streams uh, actually exceed what we use in, in mineral fertilizer. So what kind of technologies can we then uh, use? Uh, Laia's uh, project, Freddy Manure, is developing uh, some of the, of the technologies, but actually there are a number of different technologies available already, either biological, thermochemical, uh, chemical, or, or physical uh, conversions, but many of them have several barriers and challenges for, for being implemented. And if we look more in more detail at some of those that have been developed for livestock manure, um, Many of these technologies are available. They are commercially available, so they are at a high uh, GIL level. But so far, they have mainly been applied in, in, in regions with high in NNP surplus. So in the Netherlands, in, in the, the Flanders region, in, uh, in Belgium, in Catalonia, as it ex uh, exemplified by, by Laia, and, and not in many other regions yet, mainly due to high installation and running cost, and also because cheaper alternatives, for example, direct application, even if at a surplus is possible or preferred uh, because there may be uh, uh, no strict uh, environmental reg uh, regulations on this. Furthermore, I would say many of the traditional technologies for processing uh, of manures produces products uh, like digest states or solid fractions, compost, liquid fractions, or even mineral concentrate and precipitates that may not really resemble traditional fertilizers that farmers are using and that have a lot of inherent uh, problems. For example, low nutrient concentrations or, or high volumes, um, relatively uh, uncertain availability of the nutrients or uh, inappropriate NPK ratios for the, for the, for the crops in, in, in question. And often also with much higher risk of emissions of either ammonia or, or greenhouse gases 
And, and because they are biologically unstable, they are also often a source of odor or biosecurity issues. And in general, just really uh, a nuisance, uh, at least to people who are not uh, depending on the nutrients in them. And, and of course, the application of these, many of these may be a little bit tricky because they are liquid, they are low concentration. So it's heavy machinery. It's, uh, it's perhaps easy enough in regions where there is actually uh, already quite advanced manure management. So typically in the Netherlands, in Denmark, in Belgium, and many other parts of Europe, there are actually quite uh, advanced technologies for application. But then if we look across the, the whole of Europe, there is many. There will be many regions where this, these technologies are not available, or they are too costly to invest in, and where basically traditional crop farmers would say, "Well, we don't want to apply this because this is not really our practice." So, therefore, the, I think there is a lot of, of focus now on 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 processing into bio-based fertilizers that maybe resembles a traditional uh, synthetic mineral fertilizer a little bit more. Uh, and here's just a, a picture of a number from the from the Lecture Bio project. So basically, pelletized products that have a more uniform, uh, both physical and chemical uh, quality, uh, often also have a more defined nutrient availability profile, and where maybe different uh, substrates or feedstocks have been mixed so that they have a, a more uh, appropriate NPK radio. I, I assume that's what Lyre would call tailor-made uh, fertilizers. And they are typically also much more stable. They are not biologically active, and that means they can be stored. They have lower odor emissions and perhaps also lower environmental emissions of greenhouse gases or ammonia. But this is maybe a little bit uncertain. For sure, they can, in many cases, be uh, spread with traditional uh, fertilizer spreaders, so whether it's centrifugal or um, nomadic or, or, or solid organic uh, fertilizer spreaders. And, and for a majority of farmers, uh, this would actually be quite preferable. And basically, it is a result of, you can say, the EU circular economy strategy and, and some of the policies implemented uh, that that uh, uh, both the, the, the EU environmental, so the Green Deal and the, the farm to fork strategy. Uh, it includes both the, the former, re formerly regulated uh, fertilizers, the, so traditional mineral and synthetic fertilizers, but now also includes a range of organic uh, materials and waste products. Um, it contributes to define the, when these wastes can be used as input uh, for fertilizers. The fertilizer re regulation also includes not just fertilizing products, but also biostimulants and growth media and soil improvers and liming agents. And the, the regulation is, is basically designed to create a harmonized and common EU limit values for, for problematic substances and to enable this uh, CE marking so that, that fertilizers can actually be marketed and traded uh, freely throughout uh, the EU. As I said earlier, this will come into force this year. However, it is, uh, as any EU uh, regulation or EU directive, it's something that needs to be implemented in the national laws of the member states. Uh, so it will take some time before it, com it comes into to full force. Uh, there are four key uh, uh, classification uh, elements in the fertilizing products regulation. So there is uh, CMC, which is the component material categories, or you can say input materials. And there is also what is called product function categories, PFC. And we can basically say that traditional uh, mineral fertilizers are basically virgin material substances and mixtures that are processed into inorganic fertilizers. So you can say the, the, the new EU fertilizing product regulation really is an expansion both of types of input materials, but also in terms of types of product functions that this regulation uh, covers. It does also include then labeling requirements and also conformity assessment procedures. So how are we going to check that these fertilizers actually work, uh, that they are safe to use, that they can be traded and so on. And that is then focusing on, you can say both the positive, so the, the, the fertilizer value, the effects on, on soil quality, but also on the, the potential problems, sorry, the potential problems that these may have. For example, in terms of uh, increased greenhouse gases, in terms of soil contamination, in terms of potential 
leading to the uh, aquatic environment. So the Lexra Bio project uh, is an EU project not focusing so much on the technologies to produce bio-based fertilizers, but more to look at, okay, how do we actually characterize bio-based fertilizers? How do we address this in the new regulation? So you can say the Lex for Bio project, which is part of the same uh, pillar in the, in the EU research program as the Ferdi manure, is designed to, to sort of make, uh, create this evidence base for the legislative framework for optimized production and safe use of bio-based fertilizers. So the project is uh, headed by uh, Kai Ilivainu from uh, Lupi in Finland. Uh, there are 21 partners, uh, uh, and uh, the, uh, the the uh, the project is is currently running. So we are in this project looking at mapping uh, resources similar to the Ferdi manure uh, in collaboration with them. We are identifying um, novel bio-based fertilizers that have uh, a number of positive properties. We are also looking at the, the at the risks. We are looking at the, the overall, uh, can say, life cycle assessment, and also at the uh, socioeconomic factors and the, pol the, the, the policy implications of, of this. So the project has seven work packages that address these different aspects, as you see at the top. Uh, I will give some examples here from what we do in the work package on nitrogen. So it's nice that uh, Patrick talked a lot about the phosphorus. Uh, we also have a phosphorus work package. Uh, here in, in Lex for Bio, but I will say something about the, uh, the, uh, the nitrogen work package where we are looking at compliance methods for determining uh, the characteristics of bio-based fertilizers. We are testing the, uh, the economic uh, efficiency and the fertilizer replacement value in field trials, and we are assessing the environmental end losses from bio-based versus mineral end fertilizers. So what have we done? We are not looking so much at the technologies. We basically in 2020 went out and screened the European market for commercially available bio-based fertilizers. Um, not, none of them are available throughout the EU because there's no regulation, but some are, uh, all of them are either uh, available in a region or in a country or in several countries. And we are a little bit surprised that we were actually able to find more than 80 bio-based fertilizers, uh, approximately half that have uh, uh, mostly an N content. They will also contain other nutrients, but uh, mostly N. And then uh, the other half, uh, more P-based uh, bio-based fertilizers. And when we try to categorize them in this, uh, this table that you see below here, we can see that, okay, the nitrogen ones mainly belong to the food industry byproduct, the animal byproduct, or the recovered pea salts. And they are either solid uh, or are mostly solid and, and a, a few liquid ones uh, as well. And if we look at the, at the long list of the nitrogen ones, we can see, okay, they are, they are actually, a lot of them are animal byproducts. So it's uh, different types of slaughterhouse waste. They are manure based or plant based. They are, some of them digestates, uh, several of them are uh, precipitates uh, and, and, uh, and, some are mixed or, or, or compost based. Uh, here is the, the picture you saw be, before. So these, this is the typical form of these uh, on this list. So what's the challenge uh, with these nitrogen-based, bio-based fertilizers? Well, there are two main challenges uh, as we have identified in Lix for Bio, and that's the potential ammonia volatilization, and it's the profile of net nitrogen mineralization from, uh, from these, uh, these fertilizers. And, and relevant nitrogen-based, bio-based fertilizers may have a higher ammonia loss and they have, may have a lower uh, or a slower nitrogen release or, or mineralization than, uh, than mineral fertilizers. And therefore will often have, or that's at least our, our hypothesis, a more unpredictable fertilizer value. So what we are doing is we are testing in the lab and, and, uh, and in pot trials, the potential nitrogen mineralization and the potential ammonia volatilization of bio-based fertilizers. We're also trying to test various extraction methods to estimate some of these parameters. The aim is to have a combined prediction of potential plant N availability that can be used then for compliance testing of new bio-based fertilizers. I cannot show in you any data from the project yet because our, our data are not, uh, not finalized yet. So I'll basically, based on, on our preliminary results, give you some conceptual uh, ideas what it looks like. So if we look at the nitrogen mineralization, we can say, okay, if we have a, a mineral fertilizer that 
is usually at 100% of availability and it may fluctuate over time, but not at a whole lot. If we take a compost, we have typically a very low N availability to begin with, and we do have uh, some nitrogen mineralization over time, but it's usually quite low. If we take a manure, we often, or an animal slurry, we often have some mineralization, but we also often have an initial immobilization or, or unavailability of that nitrogen. But still, there is a substantial part of the nitrogen being available to begin with. If we put the, the, the animal manure or the animal slurry through a biogas digester, we often remove some of that easily degradable carbon and therefore reduce the, uh, the immobilization. And we also overall increase the, the proportion of uh, ammonia that uh, can be available. If we take something like an animal byproduct, what we often see is that they actually mineralize extremely rapidly, but that they also then stimulate a lot of biological activity that then may cause a later immobilization. If we take a plant-based fertilizer, uh, plant residues from the vegetable industry or so, they often have a quite fast mineralization, but not nearly as fast as the animal byproducts. And, and we can say, okay, this actually then matters a lot for the fertilizer value of these different uh, BBFs. So this may produce a better or a poor synchrony with crop demand, depending on what crop it is applied for. So it's, it's quite important to be able to predict these properties. If we at the same time look at the ammonia volatilization, then we can say for most mineral fertilizers, like for example, calcium ammonium nitrate, they, they typically have a rather low ammonia, volatil ammonia volatilization potential, uh, basically because they are not really uh, alkaline and do not produce any alkalinity. However, if we take a fertilizer like urea, it rapidly hydrolyzes into ammonium bicarbonate. And ammonium bicarbonate has a very high ammonia volatilization potential, basically because the, the, uh, the uh, release of CO2 at the same time drives pH up. So we can have this range. And then if we look again at our uh, fertilizers from before, compost typically have a low ammonia volatilization potential. Uh, animal slurries are somewhat higher. Digestates we find in our studies often have an even higher potential, basically because they have a higher pH and a higher bicarbonate content. And some of the animal byproducts have very low ammonia, volatil ammonia volatilization to begin with, but then later when mineralization kicks in, then it, they actually have quite a bit of potential. And again, the same thing with the, with the, with the plant base, they have a, a rather late ammonia volatilization potential. And of course, uh, or what we have found at least so far is that this is strongly related to some of the bio-based uh, fertilizer properties like pH, the proportion of ammonium, the content of, of nitrate, the CN ratio like would be expected. But it is of course also related to, and these results here were exemplified for surface applications. If we incorporate them in soil, the ammonia volatilization potential becomes very low. However, we have to remember that many of these fertilizers would be applied in growing crops, for example, winter wheat or winter cereals in general, and therefore cannot be incorporated easily. And therefore the, the potential ammonia loss from these bio-based fertilizers is really important to, to be able to, to map out uh, in order to say something about both their environmental risk, but also their fertilizer value. So of course, to say something about fertilizer value in the project, we have uh, also some field uh, experiments on five sites throughout Europe, where we test uh, 10 bio-based fertilizers uh, in two year uh, field trials in a, in a randomized uh, block design. And I'll just give one example from one of the uh, sites, uh, the one we have here in Copenhagen. So these are also used as uh, demonstration sites uh, to take farmers or consultants out and, and look at, uh, at how these bio-based uh, fertilizers perform. to 100, uh, the economic optimum or the recommended rate for spring barley uh, here in Denmark in 2021 was 137 kilograms of N. So all the bio-based fertilizers were applied at that level in total N. And that means that we can actually then quantify the fertilizer replacement value from the response curve. So basically here you can say the lines indicate a fertilizer replacement value. So you can say all of these, the majority of the, of the BBFs actually had a, a, to us, surprisingly high mineral fertilizer replacement value above, above 70%. A few had a, a lower fertilizer replacement value, but most of them actually performed quite well 
uh, in this particular trial, it was not the same for all, all five trials, I, I have to say. And that's exactly why it's important to test this out on several different, uh, different, different sites. So to finalize, I would also say something about training a new generation uh, of scientists for this bio-based fertilizer challenge, because I think it's really important when we're looking at this vision of on, of enabling upcycling or, 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 or you can say high value recycling of, uh, of nutrient rich size streams as bio-based fertilizers. And it's important to understand that we need scientists and uh, developers who are aware of the whole life cycle from cradle to cradle and, and who understand the importance of this, you can say circular uh, idea, the circular economy and that we basically try to eliminate at least, I don't think we will reach that, but our aim is to eliminate uh, waste of, uh, of nutrient rich uh, side streams. So uh, for this, we need to train a new generation of bio-based fertilizer experts and um, the European training ne networks under the Marie Curie actions are actually an ideal engine for that. And we were fortunate to achieve funding to initiate this uh, uh, 30 cycling network um, for 15 PhDs in 2020. And in that pro program, we uh, in 2020 uh, headed to uh, recruit 15 uh, talented young scientists. Um, of course, we were then hit by, by the COVID pandemic as everybody else, and uh, we were a bit in despair. In spite of this challenge, we were actually able to recruit uh, 15 extremely talented uh, young people from all over the world for this program and get them into Europe uh, just in the window that opened uh, last uh, fall. So that was very fortunate. And we're very happy to have them all on board and get them started, even though under some uh, difficulties. So what we are doing in this project is that we have uh, four, uh, we have sorry, five work packages that are basically focusing on processing, on application of the fertilizers, and on the impacts of the fertilizers. So we have two work packages: one working on organic modifications, one working on more on the in, inorganic integrations. Then we have a basically a, a work package on crop utilization uh, from application of the fertilizers. Then then two work packages on, on impacts: one on the environmental impacts and one on the markets and the, uh, the, uh, the you can say, the, the, the socioeconomics of, uh, of bio-based fertilizers. We provide them, we have then distributed these 15 uh, young scientists on the work packages and provide them with some uh, scientific and complementary training. We completed uh, online uh, a winter school for them last year uh, under the pandemic, and we are now uh, this winter also conducting our second winter school online and hope to be able to see many of our European colleagues at the Manor Resource uh, Conference in, uh, in May. So with this, we hope then that uh, we can then uh, produce some uh, uh, interesting research results that will uh, lead to high quality bio-based fertilizers and some new markets and some sustainable environment at the end of, of 2023. We uh, have already started communicating and disseminating about the results so you can follow us on our website and also sign up for the newsletter that you see here uh, that will be uh, giving details about the individual uh, projects in this program. So with this uh, 30 cycle uh, network, we uh, with 10 beneficiaries throughout Europe and se seven uh, uh, private partner organizations, the, the 30 cycle approach of upcycling uh, waste materials into uh, uh, high quality bio-based fertilizers and these 15 uh, talented uh, young people we hope to be able to have a next generation of uh, sciences for, for BBF development uh, uh, in the near future. So please follow us on, on this link. And with that, thank you for your attention and I'm open to any questions. Thank you very much, Lars. Uh, very, very interesting presentation uh, and very clear. And I suppose the interesting thing is I can see the the um, basically the similarities across the three presentations. So which we might get deeper into discussion. Um, you know, we have our panel discussion in a few minutes. Just very specific questions here, um, Lars. Just I might just pick up a few. Um, how important is the granulation? Uh, the uh, densification of manures for commercialization. Uh, it might work for uh, retailing, but farmers uh, prefer bulk, do they? Uh, I'm not sure I quite understand because uh, you can say uh, 
uh, clearly the the pelletization and mm. and processing like was also discussed by Laya uh, is yeah is that cost. could be a question and, for Laya yeah so mm. if Laya wants to come in there for a minute maybe um it's a question from Alejandro thank you Alejandro for your question so um so I'll just repeat uh, yeah Yes, I'll repeat please. the question. Yeah, okay. So how important is the granulation uh, uh, and densification of manures for commercialization? Uh, it might work for retailing, but farmers prefer bulk, do they not? Well, in our case, we have a uh, different uh, product. So we are, uh, we will be pelletalizing some of them. It's something yes. that we have not uh, still evaluated. So there's a task, a specific task focusing on logistics of the products that we are obtaining. Uh, and of course, this is something important to, to be considered. Um, I cannot uh, give an answer to, to this right now, but yes, yeah. it's something that has to be evaluated. Yeah, perfect, Leia. I have a question here, Lars, um, um, Lars or Leia fr from uh, Carl Richards in Chagask. So the, he asked- Liza is um, uh, um, thinking, sorry. Oh, sorry, I lost you there for a few minutes. Um, I have a question here for, for Lars uh, or Leia. Um, it, are there ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from bio-based fertilizer, such as improved timing to avoid denitrifying soil conditions or modifying to reduce nitrification rates or reducing carbon availability? And I, and I think this has got another few likes as well. And it's an important question, I think, from things we're going to, I suppose, maybe pick up in the panel discussion. Yeah, I, I can try and, and, and give a, a few comments on it. There is no doubt, as, as Carl indicates, that many yeah. of these bio-based fertilizers will produce increased uh, uh, biological activity and therefore also risk of greenhouse gas emissions. However, I do think there are uh, uh, means to actually mitigate this. So, for example, using in inhibitors, but also uh, acidifying the, 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 the products that often reduces both the carbon availability, uh, the, the methane emission and the N2O in, in emissions. So I think there are some, some opportunities for, for formulating these bio-based fertilizers to actually produce much less greenhouse mm. gas and ammonia emissions than the raw materials themselves, because that's one of the inherent problems of manures, for example. Yeah, it's important. It's a very, very important question, particularly in the context of, of this webinar this morning and the manure management uh, network overall. Carl has another question here. Has the carbon sequestration potential of a range of bio-based fertilizers been considered, particularly where, where processing removes removes the, lab, the more labile carbon fractions? Very valid uh, question uh, again, and and I think it's some. I mean, it, it is a, it is something we are addressing in in both the Lex for Bio and the and the Ferdy Cycle projects. As Carl also knows, the, the one of the main problems is that in in short term three, four, five year projects, you cannot really investigate what is the long term soil quality impact. But there, I think we, we just have to utilize some of the of the uh, of the few existing long-term trials with bio-based fertilizers uh, or or equivalents of bio-based fertilizers. Um, and uh, one second, another question came in here. Um, one second, yeah, from Klaus. Um, it seems that you, uh, as well, study the environmental footprint of bio-based fertilizers. What parameters do you study besides ammonia emissions? Other other end gases and leaching, soil uh, health parameters, perhaps. So, so uh, I, I can. Uh, we do not cover everything in either yes, of the projects. Of course. But in the lecture bio, we have a main focus on ammonia because we think that is one of the main main issues. It is clear that we are also interested in the greenhouse gas emission. We do not monitor greenhouse gas emissions in the in the field. Uh, we have other other programs that uh, that that do that. Uh, in terms of of long term soil quality, we can say well, uh, as I said before, it's difficult to evaluate the long term. But we do have the work package two in Lexco Bio that tries to address the soil quality aspects uh, of of various bio based fertilizers. Okay, another question here for you from uh, Peter. Thanks for your very interesting talk, Lars. Uh, good to see that your project treats the ammonia emissions issue very seriously, uh, despite uh, greenhouse gas frenzy. Um, still a question about the N2O. Yeah, so so I guess the question mm. is, okay, how, mm. how do they affect, and I mean, these bio-based fertilizers affect the N2O? 
in, in general, I think we find that the, the, the more uh, labile or the more available the carbon is, the higher the risk is that we have increased N2O uh, emissions. Many of, of these pelletization and processing procedures do, however, reduce that risk. But, but uh, complete mapping of this, no, we don't have that yet. Okay. Um, another question here. Would you look into the environmental footprints of bio-based fertilizers? Example, the effects on the soil microbiome, but also with regard to gaseous uh, end losses and leaching? Kind of a similar question. Mm. So uh, I, I can say that that uh, compared to what Patrick showed, we, we do not mm. in this project, and in, in, in neither of the projects, we have any uh, extensive microbiome studies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at, at, from other research, we have a, a two long-term trials here at University of Copenhagen where we have looked at this. And we basically find the same result as Patrick, that there is actually surprisingly little uh, impact on the, on the uh, diversity or the, you can say, the, the, uh, the Shannon index and all the other, other parameters mm -hmm. that you can use to characterize the microbial or the diversity or, or the microbiome in general. Um, so it's not like it's impeding significantly on, on the microbiome. Okay. Um, a question here from Julia. I would like to ask a question about LCA uh, work package. Uh, many LCA studies have, had tried, have, have tried to compare mineral to organic fertilizer, have found that mineral fertilizers actually show a lower environmental impact than organic ones because, for example, ecosystem services are not considered in this approach. Mineral fertilizers have a high TRL, etc. Have you uh, also encountered this challenge with the bio-based fertilizers you analyzed? Of course, and this is one of the fundamental challenges. And, and I think both in, in Lias, uh, fertile manure, and in the Lexo bio and the, and the fertile cycle, we are trying to address this. And, and we do actually have discussions on, okay, can, uh, can we uh, make some conformity on how we analyze this? Uh, agree on a, because this is, LCA is a very nice tool, but it mm -hmm. is also a tool that can be twisted and tweaked in many, many different ways and therefore becomes completely incomparable if there's not a common standard. And a very specific question here, um, asking about any postdoc positions open in the project of FertiCycle. Sorry, no. Okay. Well, it's all for PCs. Uh, okay, and there's uh, another one here is that the regulation, the EU 2019, um, um, 1009 fertilizer products <clears throat> is already in force. Um, is Professor Jensen talking about this regulation or a different one? I understood that um, 1009 2019 is a new one that will be implemented soon. I'm not sure I understood. The, the, I mean, it, it, so it's, the, it, 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 it's labeled 2019 because that's how it's labeled in the EU regulatory system, but it comes yeah. into force this year. Okay, that's good. Well clarified. Thank you. Uh, so, um, have the various possible biofertilizer production technologies been studied from the viewpoint point of view of production scale? I suppose this is a question really for all the, the speakers this morning. Are, are they only suitable for highly centralized livestock production? So, very large farms, for example. Manure, especially liquid manure, has a low nutrient density, and the log uh, logistics played a decisive role. How far is it? Um, how far is it possible to uh, miniaturize uh, different technologies to fit smaller farms? And uh, Le Laia and uh, and P and uh, Patrick, please get involved as well in this particular question. I think this is about production scale. I can start if you want. Yeah, uh, that's great. Yeah. So uh, of course, uh, always the, the 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 bigger farms will have uh, easier. Um, means to, to, to implement these technologies rather than the, the smaller ones. But um, we, for example, in Ferti Manure, what we are, uh, one of our pilots is uh, focusing on a mobile pilot that mm -hmm. can be uh, used by different farms. So this is targeting a small farms that can uh, um, share a treatment uh, technology and can be moved from one farm to the other. So there's mm -hmm. options also for uh, small farms and why not also having a, a common um, decentralized uh, treatment uh, plant uh, where different uh, uh, manures from different farms can, can be treated there. 
Uh, and uh, regarding the scale in, in Ferti Manure, we have a different scale. So it's relevant scale. Some of uh, the, techno the units are already industrial size. Uh, most of them, however, are uh, smaller at uh, DRL7 more or less. But our idea is to see how these technologies can be scaled up and which cost would these technologies have at the real scale and then do like um, a cost benefit analysis to see which would uh, be a, um, a reasonable size of the farm to, to have these technologies implemented. But as I said, it's not, uh, there's no, not a unique solution. There's not a unique technological scheme to be applied in mm -hmm. a farm. So there are also other formulas that can be considered to make it more attractive uh, for the farmers. And, mm -hmm. and I agree that for the liquid fraction is the, the more challenging one rather than the solid, uh, because uh, there's a huge amount of water. So I agree that uh, the most challenging part is uh, to, to treat the liquid fraction and, and try to, to recover the nutrients there and then have a final uh, water stream that can be reused somehow in the same farm or, or just uh, uh, have not, uh, um, can be discharged in the, mm -hmm. without uh, any risks. Of course, yeah. Patrick, would yeah. you like to comment from your side? Yeah, I suppose just to, to kind of speak generally, kind of from some mm -hmm. of the observations that, that we've made, and I suppose that's what we're doing today is kind of sharing exactly. some of those experiences. Um, Look, I suppose the bio-based fertilizers and are kind of a very diverse and broad group, and some of those might be produced on farm or separated on farm, as I think the question is is, is kind of directed. Um, I would say, like in, in Ireland, it, it is it is in its infancy, but there are um, at least one mobile unit that's going around and is is actually separating the liquid solid fraction of. Of, um, of cattle slurries, someone can show up in your yard and, and, and do that se separation with a, a mobile unit. Um, I suppose we saw a more advanced version of that in a, in a pig unit in Denmark some years ago where, where that system was actually um, w within the, the system there fixed and, and operating a way where, and that allowed them to keep, let's say the nitrogen dense fraction close to the croplands. Um, in the area, so that's the bulkier fraction, and then export um, the, the separated fraction further afield. And I suppose we have similar issues there um, in, in Ireland. Um, but for the bio-based fertilizers generally, um, you know, like these are coming from different streams and there's different drivers for them. So for instance, with the production of struvite and that precipitation there, um, you know, this can be scaled to fit larger scale sewage dis discharge systems in larger cities. And obviously the cost is huge, but it is producing the bio-based fertilizer. And often a driver there is to meet the P discharge limit uh, for, them, for the material that, that they're discharging. Um, and I know that you know, there, there is some work um, in Ireland looking at fitting these type of systems to, uh, to, to smaller plants. But okay, I suppose there is an issue of cost there. And, and if you take a big processor of material like the dairy um, industry and that some of the products that, that I re referred to, you know, that they've got, I suppose, systems in place that, you know, they're not at pilot scale, they're at large scale and they, they have, I suppose, the cost structure to be able to um, pull that phosphorus out uh, to, meet, to meet their requirements and aside chain of that is a bio-based fertilizer that can be available to farm farmers. So, so I suppose it, it, these are not just going to come from, you know, pilot scale systems that every farmer mm. can set up, but rather maybe mobile systems and, and also a flow of products from, um, from, um, from larger systems. And look at, I think the, the pelletized products that um, are, are being looking at, looked at there that Leila and Lars mentioned, mm. Um, and the work that's going on there is very interesting, like those mobile um, pelletizing systems um, are something that's available at, at probably a, a lower cost if you can access them and know how to use them. But I suppose in the theme of discussion, I, I was wondering, the, uh, um, of, of the 19 fertilizer products that, that you're producing there, you know, which do you think are the ones that are kind of gravitating to the top as, as the most applicable or the most practical or the, the ones that could maybe be most cost effectively be produced or maybe you're not quite at that stage yet but some general comment on that yeah it's a good question 
Okay. Yes. So um, as we were saying, we will have to see the, the logistic part, but I would say that uh, for this moment, uh, we have uh, several ammonium nitrate or ammonium sulfate uh, solutions with, which are quite uh, concentrated in nitrogen. So this, I think these ones could compete with, uh, with the current mineral fertilizers. Uh, then we um, are also having some uh, phosphorus uh, ashes. So uh, ashes rich in phosphorus from which we uh, want to recover phosphoric acid. So I think this uh, also this, uh, uh, the amount of uh, phosphorus in these ashes are, is quite attractive. Um, then it's, uh, yeah, I would say that these two ones are quite, uh, they have uh, potentials. As I said, for the ammonium nitrate, uh, we have uh, different ones. Uh, we will have to see it, uh, but yeah, maybe I would uh, now um, highlight uh, these two types of uh, products, one rich in nitrogen, one uh, rich in uh, phosphorus. Um, it will also depend on, on the use that we want, because for, for, for formulating tailor-made fertilizers, this could, these ones could be attractive, but maybe depending on the surrounding crops of the farm, they are willing to have more... Uh, so for example, we are producing a, a nitrate concentrate. So this one contains different types of uh, nutrients and, and micronutrients that maybe can be more attractive if they are looking for a product with a more different type of nutrient content. So we would need to see which um, is the best uh, strategy for each of the products, depending on the nutrient concentration, but also on the quality. So it's only nitrogen, it's only phosphorus, or it's a mix of, uh, of mm -hmm. nutrients. And also about the, the form that we said, okay, so the challenges here, or the, the liquid ones, how we can deal with them. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Lea. Uh, Lars, you have a, you want to come in there? Yeah, I, I, th I think I would like to make the comment because I, I mm. can hear from some of the questions that there is a bit of a of, 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 of questioning, when is this relevant? And I think that's mm. really, really a, a, an important aspect. I think Absolutely. many of these advanced technologies are only relevant where we have these really significant surplus problems. It's not, I, I think none of us are advocating that all manures uh, should be treated. I think rather, mm -hmm. and this is perhaps then again in the global context, more important that, that the first step is of course, ensure, ensuring proper manure management in terms of utilization and minimizing emissions. For most farmers, that would be the first step. Mm -hmm. But however, when we do have these very concentrated uh, livestock operations, whether it is uh, at a farm level or it's at a dairy processing unit at a big slaughterhouse, then self-evidently, then there is a, a management problem, but there is also a, an economy to cover for some of the, of the much higher cost of, of processing and so on. And, and there is no doubt that within the EU, we do have to do something about these surpluses that we have in certain regions. And so far, it's been managed by transporting thousands of truckloads of manure across borders, across regions, causing a lot of nuisance and energy uh, costs, uh, greenhouse gas emissions from that. So, so, so again, we have to look at the bigger picture. There is one caveat though to, to this and to the whole circular economy in general, in my opinion, and that is that, okay, if we rely much more on recycling and bio-based fertilizers, we also make ourselves much more dependent on the industries or the, you can say the processing residues. What happens if in 10 or 20 years time, what hopefully many would say that we will have a much less animal-based diet? Mm -hmm then all of a sudden some of the basis of this recycling disappears. I think that's, that's you can say, at a slightly longer scale, yes, animal product the demand worldwide will still grow, but in 10, 20 years, we could see a major change. And that will actually make it more difficult to do this yeah. circular economy, in my opinion. That's a very good point, Lars, absolutely. Um, we have a number of questions coming in now here, so I'm going to try and get few, to, through a few of them. So um, just maybe the three of you can, uh, you'll know if the question is for you, so maybe you can just answer it uh, in due course. So the first one here is, um, African soils are inherently pea depleted, yet mineral fertilizers are usually imported and therefore expensive. Are there any recommendations for pea rich bio based fertilizers uh, from and for tropical regions, particularly Africa? From Sonia. 
Anyone like to take that question? It goes a little bit to what you, it goes a little bit to what's available locally. And I suppose that's kind of yeah. part of this uh, circular concept. Um, and also what ability is there to, um, what, what ability is there to, to process or, or re recover phosphorus uh, locally? Um, mm -hmm. You know, I suppose in, in some of the work that we've done, you know, granted it's one site uh, soil in Ireland, and as Lars mentioned, it is important to evaluate these things over a larger number of sites. But what we yeah. did see was that what was that at least at that site there was a trend for, let's say, the availability of the struvite to the plant, and um, being mm -hmm. superior to that of the mineral phosphorus over time. So, look, okay, I suppose how that would play out in your soils and your climatic conditions would probably need to be looked at. But I think there's mm -hmm. some potential potential there. Um, and it's regionality, I guess, and, and having local, um, you know, options. Uh, Lars, you want you have your hand raised. Do you want to come in there? Yeah, I, I would just like to make the comment. I think it was sure. so the results you showed, Patrick, on on multiple year phosphorus availability from different products. Mm -hmm. I think was really really interesting, yeah. and also thought provoking in the sense that when we have really highly p fixing soils like we typically do in the tropics, mm -hmm. then then for sure mineral fertilizer so highly available phosphorus is not necessarily the best option yeah. mm -hmm. and actually some of the bio-based fertilizers uh, will have a much higher potential both in the short term but also in the longer term in the sense that they may retain some of the phosphorus from being fixed in in all the aluminium and iron oxides of, of an of an oxysol so so i think in that context bio-based mm -hmm. fertilizers for sure have potential but as you say patrick yeah. They need to be available in sufficient quantities, and that's often the problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and assessed over time. Yeah. Um, the question of the TMF tool. So, uh, is this TMF tool for a whole of the whole of the EU? I think that was your area, uh, Laia. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, in this mm -hmm. case, what we did is uh, to consider the participating countries in in uh, Ferti Manure. Uh, it's um, eight different countries uh, in in terms of uh, soil characteristics, and we have also considered there the BBF that we are producing in, uh, in the project, because that's uh, the idea to see how our nutrients recovered can uh, be used to formulate more um, uh, customized fertilizing products with a high mm -hmm. market value. Um, but uh, it can be uh, um, uh, broader if, we, if it's interest, if could be of interest. So uh, mm -hmm. this tool is uh, still not published yet. But we mm -hmm. will do that in the following month. So we are just improving it and uh, finalizing it. But it uh, it will be available in our website. So in case some of you want to take a look at it, uh, you can do that. And if you want us to ask some questions on how to use uh, the tool and what is included there, we will be happy to to answer this when once the yeah. tool is available. So contact Laia if you're interested. So another question here, I'll just, there's been a few for you, Laia, coming in. Uh, do you also account for ammonia emissions in your sustainability assessment? Yes, we, we are uh, considering the, the emissions in, in the measurement. Yeah. So when we are uh, using the bio-based fertilizing products and also in the technology application, we are measuring it and, and we will be considering it in our sustainability assessment. And a related question, you probably addressed this earlier from Carl. Uh, do you quantify the greenhouse gas emissions from bio-based fertilizers and how do they compare to mineral fertilizers? Yes, we will be measuring it also. And uh, because yeah. we will be comparing our products with the mineral fertilizers, then we will also be comparing it. Another question for you. Uh, I'll just get these done now. Uh, what are your your and your partner experiences uh, when applying membrane technologies to separate liquid fractions from pig slurry. Are there any major challenges uh, and is there any pilot installed? Yes, the membrane uh, technologies for the liquid fraction are in the Spanish mm -hmm. pilot. And okay. uh, here we have uh, different uh, membranes installed. So we have, uh, um, I would say three, mem th three membrane systems uh, following each other. So we have microfiltration, we have membrane contactors where we are recovering uh, ammonium uh, nitrate from there. And finally, uh, a reverse osmosis uh, membrane system. So at this moment, uh, we are optimizing the system. We have not found um, many 
uh, fouling problems at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Our challenge now is to see how we can increase the concentration of ammonium uh, nitrate coming out from the membrane contactors. But for the moment, we are we are not uh, facing major problems here. I think that with the membranes, what we will have to see is the, the costs that the system will have to treat the, the liquid fraction. Okay, uh, I have another question here. Do you think bio-based fertilizers can be optimized well to sync with the soil and plant uh, need considering uh, their diversity? Uh, what are the challenges you face so far? So in this case, uh, um, as I said- Do they sync we well are... with the soil? Yeah, and the soil and the plant. So I suppose getting those harmonized Sorry, can you repeat this last? So part? basically, the question the question is is, mm -hmm. is do you think that the bio based fertilizers can be optimized well to sync or you know with the um, to be in synchrony with the soil and plant? Uh, does yeah. That need con considering their diversity. No, no. So what, what what the plant and the soil needs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, exactly. Yeah. Sorry, what I didn't uh, understand was your final uh, addition. But in any case, yeah. yes. Uh, here, that's why we introduced the concept of tailor-made fertilizer, because, uh, uh, of course, the bio-based fertilizers that we are recovering in the, in the plants can be directly used if, uh, if, it's, if they are suitable for the farmer. But then what we would need is to see which are the requirements of the crops and the soil where these products will be applied. And that's mm -hmm. why we, depending on the needs of the soil, depending on the needs of the crop where we will be applying these products, we will be combining different uh, bio-based fertilizers to obtain uh, the tailor-made fertilizers. It, ca it can also include some um, mineral fertilizers if needed. So it, it doesn't have to be only uh, bio-based fertilizers, but also we can add other components to the formulation to make it mm -hmm. more adequate. Perfect. Uh, another question here uh, from Nabil it says, thank you for your presentation. I have a more practical question. How do you predict the quantity and quality of mixed species farms? I'm not sure if I'm... I yeah, I'm not, sure the, the I'm not sure either. I'm not sure. I'm yeah, not sure I, about this question. Yeah, if you want to, Nabil, maybe clarify a little bit. I, I'm confused as well about that one. Um, okay, what, uh, what differences describe anaerobic digestion and fermentation? Quite a general question there. Not sure who... Yeah, this is for, from... Is it from for me? Jacob. <laughs> I think it's, it might be for everybody. If anybody wants to come in there, uh, that's quite a... When you think of... Uh, Fermentation, we think of maybe rumen fermentation is probably a similar process to anaerobic digestion. Um, maybe that's what they're getting at. Is, would Lars or Patrick want to come in there? Well, I, I think it was maybe mentioned in Lars' presentation. I, don't, I, I yeah. can say fermentation is the broader term, anaerobic digestion is when we do it specifically to produce methane. Exactly. Yeah. Or, or yeah. biomethane for, for energy production. Um, we do also do fermentation when we, for example, bioacidify uh, various mm -hmm. stocks, uh, but that's yeah. not with the, um, there we would like, actually like to avoid methane production. Yeah, so really, I suppose the enteric fermentation, I suppose, area working myself in, in the rumen of the animal creates methane, but I suppose anaerobic digestion is outside of the rumen and when it's purposely for, to produce mm -hmm. methane. So um, I, guess, I guess that might clarify what you're looking for there. Um, if livestock production is going to survive in the longer term, the GHG emissions need to be reduced substantially. Nitrification inhibitors um, may be one way to do this. Does anyone have plans to investigate if nitrogen inhibitors will work uh, with these novel organic fertilizers? Anyone like to come in there? I might, I might comment on this because we, we've done yeah. some work with um, nitrification inhibitors on conventional mineral fertilizers in the past. And um, thanks, Patrick. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we, we've, we've seen that, that they, you know, that they can reduce uh, nitrous oxide emissions for uh, high ammonium containing or producing fertilizers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I suppose there's a few issues that I suppose just as a kind of general comment on it. Um, I suppose the, the nitrification inhibitor class, I suppose, has been growing. Um, there's some issues there around, I suppose, the ability of the nitrification inhibitor to stay with the fertilizer under leaching pressure um, and how this matches into the, the synchrony of ammonium becoming available, perhaps from organic nitrogen sources um, in, the, 
in, in the particular product. So I, I think that the use of nitrification inhibitors with bio-based fertilizers would probably be, have to be very specifically matched to the, you know, the particular bio-based fertilizer. So for instance, that ammonium sulfate concentrate that Leia mentioned, um, mm -hmm. there you've got a readily available ammonium fertilizer, and it would seem like a good, like a good fit for something like that. Um, however, if you've got something perhaps that's composted, as Lara showed there, very slow availability of mm -hmm. nitrogen that's mineralizing over time, the nitrification inhibitor, its half-life is not likely to be a good fit for, for something like that. So that's just a, a kind of a general comment. Yeah. No, thank you, Patrick. That's very useful. There's a question here that Lars would like to answer. Um, so basically, it's a question from Veronica. She says, I fund um, research in the Pacific where soils are poor, biogas digesters are increasingly common, but the kind of higher tech uh, optimization approaches you are working on are almost certainly not possible. Producers are, are small scale and often don't even have access to soil testing kits. What advice would you give about the potential for this approach in these kinds of developed developing country context? And this is a very good question, an int interesting question, and I suppose it's relevant for, for our GRA activities as well. So Lars, do you want to answer that, please? Yes, yes. Uh, it, it was not part of my presentation, but I would like to answer it because I some years back, we had a, a long-term collaboration with Vietnamese research institutions uh, because of the, the very rapid expansion of bio, small scale biogas digesters in, in, in Vietnam. And they were encountering numerous problems with this because basically you can say the perception of the farmers was that this was basically a manure purification plant leading to the fact that digestate was often just discharged directly into rivers and lakes and so on, whereas manures traditionally was were perhaps utilized in a more sensible way. So what we what we worked on there was actually then quantifying, you can say basic proper management principles for the digestate. So actually quantifying what is its fertilizer value? How can it be applied? Uh, of course, there's particular problems when uh, the main uh, cropping system is paddy rice, where you have flooded fields. Therefore, the application of digestate is a little bit more difficult, and there may be also implications for methane emissions and so on. So there, that we work with, but but it was we clearly demonstrated uh, in that work uh, in several papers that that, that there are options like uh, intermittent irrigation, um, alternate wetting and drying irrigation, and so on that can actually uh, substantially increase both the fertilizer value of digestates and also reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. So, so I think it's it's uh, it's possible uh, again implementing uh, simple proper manure management principles. The problem, of mm -hmm. course, in many uh, of these countries is that then farmers may have six, seven small fields distributed at a distance from their their household. So, therefore, mm -hmm. the transport of the digestate is a significant uh, challenge. Thank you, Lars. Um, another question here. Thanks for your valuable presentations. Uh, could it be said that the proper use of organic waste from production can fully uh, ensure the nutrient balance? I would like to take that question from Zygmaz. Hmm. Well, I, I, I can just say that, that I agree that, mm -hmm. that, of course, it should ensure proper nutrient balance. Mm -hmm. However, there are some trade-offs. So maybe we can ensure a proper nitrogen balance, but then we end up with a, a, a problem with the phosphorus balance or that we try to use it for ensuring soil quality or, or soil carbon sequestration, then we have an overload of nutrients. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so some of the, of the technologies that we have been proposing here in, in these three presentations is also to actually circumvent or overcome some of those trade-offs. Mm -hmm. um, Exactly. Uh, as Laya exactly. was I think saying, a good point. being able to design proper nutrient ratios, uh, either no carbon fertilizers or carbon containing fer fertilizers, depending on what the purpose is. Mm -hmm. Uh, another question from Klaus. Uh, I guess that you may study soil carbon effects using, uh, I suppose, labeled uh, carbon 13 labeled um, bio based fertilizers. Did anyone consider this? Um, we know clouds uh, uh, like isotopes, so yeah. Uh, this, is, <laughs> okay. this, this is this is uh, is uh, of course an interesting approach. The the difficulty, yeah. like with any animal study, is that you need to then put the carbon in upfront 
in the in the you can say uh, residue stream which does complicate it a bit so mm -hmm. we have not included it yet we are using nitrogen isotopes uh, or, or and 15 extensively in our in our studies but not the the carbon so far okay and one here what is the relationship oh sorry patrick go ahead yeah yeah sorry i, I just saw it as an opportunity just to come in with sort of a yeah. comment or a bit of mm -hmm. advocacy um sure that uh, you know based on some of the questions that klaus has asked around carbon and some of the conversation around the longer and shorter term effects i think like generally as a community working in this area and Lars also highlighted that issue around longer term trials and getting those longer term trials yes. in place. And this is a challenge often within the, the scope of funded projects. So look, I think for us as researchers in this area and organizations working in this topic, uh, the trying to have that those longer term sites or continuing sites that um, are started off in some funded project is, is is something that I think we, we, we need to try and try and accomplish in whatever way we can ourselves and kind of advocate Here and it's very relevant. Um, um, as this is a GRA webinar, what advice would you give to countries where bio-based fertilizers are not uh, very developed? And that, that hits on some of the questions from that you addressed there, Lars. Um, um, I suppose is there anything else you want to add to that for developing countries? Uh, no, I, I I think I mentioned you, before what, yeah. uh, what my my feedback would be on that. Yeah, that perfect. Question. Yeah, no, maybe, that, maybe that's Lyle perfect. Or Patrick has some. Some yeah, I, I just wanted to kind of yeah. come back on the point about Africa and the question that was asked there sure, um, yeah. about, you know, and we talked about what's available and the bio-based fertilizers and the process side of thing that maybe some potential for the struvite, but, you mm -hmm. know, particularly the animal manures that are that are there in place and the utilizing of them and the phosphorus that's in them and getting those to the soils and the ability of the phosphorus in animal manures, perhaps to resist some of that lockup and supply P to the plant. I think that's a, a kind of a... A, a first win to, to look at and look at not in every region in Africa I'm sure but in some regions you, you, um, manure may be also you might be competing with it as a fuel source so mm -hmm. I suppose that 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 aspect is something to look at if you're needing phosphorus for for the plant that could is a local resource yeah, yeah and we're, we're running out of time a quick question for for Lars um, um, and it builds on exactly this again. Um, what kind of bio-based fertilizer is better for use um, in tropical countries such as Indonesia? Have you any advice, Laris, there or any comment? Well, first of all, I would say proper use of manure and not discarding mm. it as a waste. That's the number one. And second one yes. is then minimizing ammonia loss because under tropical conditions, uh, high temperature, uh, significant the risk of ammonia loss. So mm -hmm. that, those would be my two primary advices. Yeah, and I have a question here. Soren asked a question earlier to, to, to Leia on the, the membrane-based technologies, and he's asking again, um, was acidification, uh, acidification needed, Leia, to prevent, say, clogging, fouling, and cleaning? Well, in this case, uh, the, with the membrane conductors that we are yeah. using, yes, we are acidifying uh, here okay. to obtain this, uh, this ammonium uh, nitrate. Uh, but uh, for the reverse osmosis, uh, we, we have not done any specific uh, treatment of, of, the, of our effluent. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the acidification was for the membrane conductors to obtain the, the product that we want, and it's uh, a, a characteristic of this uh, technology. But mm -hmm. yeah, for the moment, we are not, ex um, so we have not operated it in long term. So we are in the optimization part, and we have done some trials and some runs of, uh, of our system, but we will have to see it more in a long term uh, during the two following years if we are having these uh, fouling problems, which cleaning procedures do we have to follow? And it's something that we will uh, be, will be seen in a later stage. Thanks, Leah. And I own final question here from Mohammed. What is the relationship between the biofertilizers and carbon sequestration? Has anyone looked at that or anyone want to comment? Yeah, I think Lars has made some comments on this just yeah. in relation I to 
look at the, the, the ability of shorter term trials to assess this. And I think mm. this is why as a community working in this area, if we can put in place trials that can exist for longer, we at least have some data to shoot perhaps into models to give us uh, some trajectory on that. But I suppose the mm -hmm. inherent um, characteristics of the bio-based fertilizers themselves will give some insight into that. You know, there was a mm -hmm. question there around do farmers prefer bulk or a concentrated yeah. product? Yes. Um, look, from, from a perspective of soil quality or health, farmers recognize if they have a bulkier um, material mm -hmm. like slurry that brings more carbon or uh, farmyard manure that brings carbon, they can tend to see differences in the tilt of the soil and the soil health aspects. Um, whereas with a bio-based fertilizer that's concentrated, it may be more similar to its, a mineral fertilizer in how it behaves. I will say in our, let's say, uh, longer than one year trial, but not long-term mm -hmm. trial, uh, that's, I suppose, going into its fourth year now. Uh, we did do some work uh, last year uh, looking at uh, the, the worm levels that were, were there as an indicator, I suppose, of, 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 of the effects mm -hmm. on soil health and where the slurry treatment was used, that bulkier material, we did see a beneficial effect on the, um, on the um, earthworm uh, population as compared to the mineral pea fertilizer or the struvite uh, pea fertilizer, the struvites. We are also tracking soil carbon annually in those plots. Um, but, you know, look at the, the changes level. Look, you're not going to see changes over that mm. period of time. Um, Thanks, Patrick. We're just gone over the two hours now and uh, it really flew. I'd like to, we, there's still some questions in the Q&A, but we will answer those offline uh, and they will be made available on the website. So um, the Secretariat will deal with those questions um, and, the, and the speakers will, will get in touch in relation to answering them. So I'd like to take the opportunity to really thank the speakers this morning, Patrick, Lars and Leah for really interesting presentations and an excellent contribution to our panel discussions. There's definitely a lot of, of uh, you know, overlay across the different countries and we should really collaborate is, is the, I suppose, the question and look for funding opportunities within the manure management network. And this is a really interesting area of research um, at the moment. So I'd like to thank all the attendees. We we're up on about 124 um, attendees at one stage during the webinar, which is excellent. Um, and I'd like to especially thank Deb and Heather and the Secretariat for all their help in running this webinar and preparing for it. Uh, and Tony van der Rieden, who gave us a lot of help in getting started as well, who, who cannot be here today. So thanks a million to the speakers and look forward to seeing you all again. And please keep active within the within the web within the, the network uh, until we see you again many thanks bye bye oh pleasure thanks Sarah. thank you thank bye you so yeah. thanks. Goodbye, thank everyone. you very much thank you bye. Bye. Yeah. thank you for joining <laughs>